The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. Hey, podcaster. Meet Acast. We're the top independent podcast network for creators in the know. We empower you to develop your podcast idea, find your audience, and grow listener relationships, wherever those listeners are. You'll also find a whole range of ways to make money, from membership plans for paying fans to our fully curated and creative advertising experience. Visit acast.com slash network to find out more. Acast, for the stories. This is the Lawfare Archive. Hello, this is Lawfare intern Christiana Wayne with an episode from the Lawfare Archives for July 25th, 2021. Boris Johnson has had a busy week. On Monday, the United Kingdom celebrated the long-anticipated and controversial Freedom Day, lifting all coronavirus restrictions, even as infection rates in the UK are soaring and Johnson himself is in self-isolation after he was exposed to an infected person. Then, on Wednesday, his government announced its desire to redraw a section of the post-Brexit trade agreement concerning Northern Ireland. The EU said it would not renegotiate the deal made in 2019 under Johnson's leadership. For today's episode from the Archives, I chose a conversation between Benjamin Wittes and Amanda Sloat from August 2019, just after Boris Johnson was appointed Prime Minister. Amanda Sloat is currently the Senior Director for Europe on President Biden's National Security Council. She was formerly a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. She and Ben talk about the Prime Minister's politics, his Brexit strategy, and Brexit's impact on American politics. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, August 10th, 2019. The United Kingdom has a new Prime Minister. It also has a looming cliff. It is careening toward and about to leap off on, you got it, Halloween of this fall. This week, I sat down with Amanda Sloat, my Brookings colleague and the Robert Bosch Senior Fellow in the Center on the United States and Europe. She's also a fellow with the Project on Europe and the Transatlantic Relationship at Harvard's Kennedy School. And she's about my favorite Brookings colleague to talk about Brexit with. Amanda and I talked about all things Brexit. We talked about that new British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, and his hair. We talked about his views on Brexit. We compared Johnson to his American counterpart and his hair. And we talked about the deadlock between Britain and the European Union, as well as the way the Brexit debate plays out in American politics. It's the Lawfare Podcast, Episode 442, Amanda Sloat on Boris Johnson and Brexit. Let's start with personality because it's, you know, it's it's Kim Kardashian's world and we just live in it. So talk to me about Boris Johnson. Well, we have plenty of personality now in the uh, British government. So Boris Johnson, uh, who had told his childhood friends and aspired one day to be world king, has finally become prime minister of the UK. Not quite world king, but the leadership position he <laughs> has. It's a good running start. It's not bad. It's not bad. You know, he served as, as mayor of London. He served as foreign secretary uh, and has fulfilled this lifelong ambition of becoming prime minister of the UK. Uh, it was a, a rather curious process in in the UK, where Theresa May, of course, eventually was driven to step down because of everything with Brexit. You had about 10 conservative members of parliament putting themselves forward for the job. Their fellow MPs whittled the list down to two. And then that got sent out to the 160,000 paid up members of the conservative party in the UK. So somewhat similarly to Americans in Iowa standing in the corners of gymnasiums leading to our presidential nominee, 160,000 people in the UK uh, voted. So he has the support of about 0.1% of the British population by that margin. But 
but Boris is is now the the leader, uh, and he has a very narrow parliamentary majority. He lost a by election last week, so he has a majority of one, and even that requires the support of ten members of the hardline Northern Ireland Unionist Party. All right. So, first of all, how stable? You know, this is a narrow government. But narrow does not necessarily mean weak or unstable. How long should we expect it to last? Given all of the given all of the political rhetoric in the UK, it does not look like it's going to last for very long. The UK really over the last couple of years has become a single issue country and that's focused on Brexit. The Conservative Party leadership contest was focused on Brexit. All of the current discussions are focused on Brexit. And I think the future resilience of this government is very much going to focus on Brexit. Everybody now is increasingly talking about there being general elections. The question is whether Boris Johnson ends up calling them himself at some stage, or whether his government is brought down by a vote of no confidence by the opposition in parliament, uh, which could potentially happen as soon as early September when members return from their August recess. All right. So we're going to talk about all of the Brexit and parliamentary machinations in a moment. But I want to, in keeping with the spirit, the relentless spirit of substanceless on the Lawfare podcast, want to talk about Boris Johnson's personality for a minute. Uh, He is often compared to Donald Trump, both because of certain antics like behavior, also because of the mop of hair thing. To what extent are those comparisons valid and to what extent are they not valid? The hair comparison is certainly valid. They both share a dislike of the European Union and they share a desire to reach an agreement on a trade deal. Beyond that, I think the comparisons are a bit overstated. Boris Johnson is essentially an old school conservative. He was educated at Eton, a private school. He went to Oxford. He's followed a very traditional path of many elitist uh, leaders within the UK. Uh, His father had worked in the European Commission. He spent a large part of his childhood in Brussels and elsewhere. Uh, So really comes from a different type of political class and background than what Trump did, although certainly both of them come from back grounds of privilege. Boris Johnson, I think, has adopted some of Trump's rhetoric and populist style because he has seen that that is effective politics. Uh, But Boris Johnson is essentially an old school Tory. He's a fiscal conservative. He's quite socially liberal. And a lot of his views are dependent on which way he sees the political winds blowing in a given country. Uh, The famous story that's often told about him with Brexit is Boris has, you know, previously was a journalist, has long had a weekly column with the Daily Telegraph. Telegraph, and he wrote two versions of an op-ed before the Brexit referendum. One was supporting Brexit and the other was opposing Brexit. And he wavered in the week before the votes and ultimately decided that he was going to be in favor of Brexit, which he ended up seeing as the much more politically expeditious path to take and the way the winds in the country were blowing. So from that perspective, I don't think he's particularly ideological. I think he's fairly traditional in some of his policy views, is likely to have differences of opinion with Trump, certainly on some broader foreign policy issues, but really is a political opportunist who has been seeking this job of prime minister above everything else. I want to say that Boris Johnson and I have one significant thing in common, which is that we have both fallen into the River Thames. Um, And that is the only thing, as far as I know, that we have in common. Um, Though I think to be precise, I may have fallen into the River Cherwell because it was in Oxford. Were you punting? I was. I was a very small child. (laughs) Um, All right. So one thing he has that is, I think, organic to him as well as to Trump is a kind of flamboyance and eccentricity that kind of delights his fans and uh, infuriates his foes. Unlike Trump right now, he's leading the country at the crossroads of a, you know, particularly fateful moment, the substance of which we'll come to momentarily. But I'm, I'm interested in the question of to what extent is Boris Johnson just not the sort of person that can unite, like whether anybody can unite 
the country under these circumstances. He seems to be a sort of particularly divisive figure to lead it in this particular moment in time. And I'm just kind of curious for your thoughts on the sort of clash between the individual and his persona and the moment. I think that's that's absolutely right. The odds of him uniting the country are very small. I think he's going to be much more focused on uniting the conservative party. And really, this debate over Europe and the role of Britain in Europe has been a fight within the conservative party. And one of the things that is motivating him politically is that he has Nigel Farage, who was a longtime member of the UK Independence Party, now founded this Brexit party to challenge Johnson, is breathing down his neck to deliver on a hard Brexit. So for a man whose lifelong ambition has been to be prime minister, he is not going to want to see himself brought down by somebody who's taking a harder line position on Brexit than he is. And so I think his immediate political imperative is going to be delivering on Brexit, which, as I said, was not something he's necessarily been ideologically wedded to for years, but is a decision that he made fairly last minute because of the direction of the political winds in the country. And so he now needs to deliver this to prevent a threat from a harder line party breathing down his neck on the right. All right. So let's turn now to the Brexit situation. As I understand it, we have an October deadline for a deal or Brexit happens with no deal. So you have a new government Uh, You have no appetite in the European side to reopen the understandings that they reached with Theresa May, which Boris Johnson opposes, and there is no appetite in parliament to pass. So my question is, is there any, any foreseeable mechanism in which Boris Johnson reaches a Brexit deal Uh, assuming his government lasts until October. Is there any foreseeable mechanism that you can imagine in which Boris Johnson succeeds where Theresa May did not? It's going to be incredibly difficult for a number of the reasons that you mentioned. Uh, First of all, European leaders are not going to want to be seen as more hospitable to Boris Johnson, who, as you described, is a very flamboyant, difficult, uh, particular character than the kind of deal they were able to reach with Theresa May, which, as you and I have discussed on here before, she certainly had her faults, but she was at least negotiating in good faith. She was a grown-up. She was. She was. And she was trying to reach a deal and was trying to make commitments on that basis. And so they're not going to want to be seen as being more sympathetic to Boris than they were to, to Theresa May. So that's one problem. Second, Boris has set extremely hard lines and really has backed himself into a corner. He has said he is not prepared to even negotiate with EU leaders unless they say that they will open the withdrawal agreement and they will remove the backstop for Northern Ireland, both of which have been red lines for the EU. So if you're setting an opening position that you're not even going to talk until they agree to do something that they've said they won't do, that's very difficult. Third, on whether or not there's anything they could do, There have been proposals that the EU has made to show flexibility on these issues, particularly the backstop. One possibility would be to revert to a backstop only for Northern Ireland, which is where all of this started before Theresa May made it a backstop that would apply to the entire UK. There's political reasons why that would be difficult within UK domestic politics, but that would be a possibility. Another option is that you could have a longer transition period so that Boris could go back and say, look, the backstop's not even going to come into effect for five years, we've got more time to sort this out. So there are some possibilities where you could try and fudge the deal a little bit and then see if you could sell it to Parliament. But because Boris has been so hard line, it's very difficult to see how you even have negotiations given the red lines that both sides have laid out. All right. So no prospect absent some change of heart on somebody's part Uh, magic fairy dust style, no prospect of a negotiated Brexit between Boris and the EU. The only prospect on that, which is I don't think is going to work, but is is to put the Irish under so much pressure that they would have to impose a border if there was a no deal Brexit. So the Irish are in a really difficult situation. They're the ones that have insisted you need this backstop insurance policy to protect the border. And just help 
for the listeners who don't know what the backstop is, back up and backstop the backstop for a second. Yes. Uh, the backstop is the the crux of, of all of this. So at the moment, the UK is part of the EU customs union and single market. It will leave both of those once it leaves the European Union, and then it will need to renegotiate a future economic relationship with the EU. That's going to make the border between Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, and the Republic of Ireland, which is a separate country that is going to remain in the EU, a customs border. And you need to have checks on goods if there is regulatory divergence between the UK and the rest of the EU to ensure that goods that are going into Ireland are compliant with EU regulations. Normally, you would put customs infrastructure on the border to check these goods. But because of the political situation in Northern Ireland, the legacy of violence, the legacy of a Good Friday agreement leading to the removal of customs infrastructure, that's impossible to do. So what the EU has said is unless you can come up with technology that's going to work on the border or until you come up with a future economic arrangement with us, we are going to keep all of the UK in a customs union with the EU, and we're going to require Northern Ireland to follow additional provisions on the single market to ensure that we don't need to have these checks on the border. So that's why one possibility would be to say rather than having the customs union and single market provisions apply to the entire UK, you could revert back to what the EU's initial plan was, was to have them apply only to Northern Ireland because that's where the issue is on the border. That created political problems for the Democratic Unionist Party, which is propping up Boris Johnson's government because they don't want Northern Ireland to be treated differently from the rest of the UK. All right. So – no prospect of a political deal between Boris Johnson and the EU. And therefore, the logical question, it seems to me there's two additional possibilities. One is that you actually, his government is stable enough to produce a crash out and a no deal Brexit on October 31st. And the second is that his government is not stable enough and you have some intervening event. So let's take the simpler one first. Which uh, one is that? I think the simpler one is that his government is stable enough. He has one, he has a one vote majority. He holds his people together through some combination of charm and beatings. And the result is that this uh, government survives through October and the British crash out of Brexit at that point. First of all, to what extent do you think that's likely? How realistic is that as a scenario? And secondly, is that what he's aiming for here? Or does he actually mean to try to reach a deal? Well, like, is this his objective? Excellent questions. So on the first question of whether or not the government would last, there is some grounds to, to argue that in the sense that the one thing the conservatives are united in is their dislike of Jeremy Corbyn, the self-proclaimed socialist leader of the Labor Party. There was a poll a couple of weeks ago of conservative members who supported Brexit asking them what they would be prepared to give up to deliver on Brexit. They would be prepared to lose Northern Ireland to reunify with Ireland. They would be prepared to see Scotland go independent. But the one thing that scared them was the prospect of a Labor government. So one question, if you had a vote of no confidence, is whether all of these conservatives Conservative members whose party just got hammered in local elections, European parliament elections, probably would not do well in general elections themselves, can swallow their fear about a no-deal Brexit and hang in there with, with Boris. On the question of his goal, Boris has been saying repeatedly that do or die, the UK is going to leave the EU by October 31st. His government has authorized an additional £2 billion in contingency planning for a no-deal Brexit. He has a large war cabinet that is set up, including officials that were advocates of the Leave campaign with him in 2016 that are very focused on preparing for a no-deal Brexit. Uh, interestingly, he has also said the odds of a no-deal Brexit are one in a million, uh, which raises the question of why he is spending all this taxpayer money and how he thinks he's going to get a deal given his red lines going into the negotiations. Uh, so there is one question, uh, which is essentially that we're playing a game of chicken right now between the UK and the EU. And I think the UK 
or at least Boris Johnson, fears that the Irish in the EU are going to be so scared about the prospect of a no-deal Brexit that they're going to be prepared to cave on their red lines put pressure on Ireland and do something to deal with the backstop. The EU line is that there's no incentive for them to make concessions right now, given all this churn in politics. The Irish are very committed to this idea of preserving the border, although they will be in the unique situation of pushing hard for an insurance policy to guarantee something that might end up happening if the Brits reject the insurance policy. Now, if you do have a no-deal Brexit, The thing that's going to be very difficult for Boris is you're going to need to negotiate some sort of future relationship with the EU. And the EU has said that their preconditions for negotiations on the future after a no-deal Brexit are that the Brits deal with the situation in Northern Ireland, they pay their outstanding bills, and they deal with the rights of EU citizens living in the UK. So from the EU's perspective, Boris is going to have to deal with this set of issues either now in advance of a no-deal Brexit or immediately after a no-deal Brexit. The EU's perspective is that it's going to be so catastrophic and chaotic for Boris that he's going to have to cave on all of these issues and come back to them begging for resolution to these things to negotiate a future relationship. So dumb question, but I wonder if part of what's driving Boris Johnson here is a delusional sense of who blinks in the game of chicken. So I look at this situation and I say a no-deal Brexit is a, a royal pain in the ass and very embarrassing for the EU but it is potentially catastrophic for the UK. And I don't understand why Boris Johnson would look at that situation and think that people in Brussels are suddenly quaking at the at the prospect that he might, you know, pull a 45 out of his pocket and shoot himself in the head. Is there some sort of Damocles that is hanging over Brussels that is not hanging over Boris Johnson himself or or is this or is this a situation in which he's you know standing under a giant sword and they're standing under like the toothpick of Damocles and he's like threatening them I think those are are very apt analogies I think he expects the Europeans to be much more freaked out about the prospect of a no deal Brexit than they seem to be. It's certainly going to be economically damaging and and problematic for them. It's not something they want, but they have been preparing for it for the last year or two. The French, the the Dutch, others have been hiring additional border guards. Their attitude is it's going to be painful, but but we can bear this. The only country that's really going to suffer, and interestingly, it's the one that's the most dogmatic on this question of the backstop is Ireland, uh, because Ireland, of course, is going to have to live with the consequences of a destabilized peace process in Northern Ireland, which you're already seeing continued warnings of the political, economic and security risk there. Uh, The UK government has said, we're not going to put customs infrastructure on the border with, with Ireland. We don't want to do that. The Irish government has also been saying that publicly. But the problem for them is if they want to maintain trade with the rest of the EU, they're going to have to comply with EU regulations and certify that what is coming out of their country is in compliance. And so Ireland is is really the remaining EU country that's going to get squeezed the most on this. Uh, but I think most observers uh, would agree with, with your assessment of the situation. And I find it a little hard to understand why Boris assumes that the EU is, is going to blink, which is very amped up rhetoric on no deal Brexit seems to suggest that that's the path he's very rapidly heading down. All right. So option two is that his government does not last long enough for this. Now he's got a one vote majority or however many you said he had one. one. Right. And there are plenty of of Tories who did not support Brexit and cannot be happy with this situation. And so my question is, why should we assume his government will last you know, five weeks, let alone three more months. It's it's very difficult to see uh, not having an election at some point this fall. The question is is going to be the timing. So there's two things essentially that parliament could do. One is MPs could try and seize control of the House of Commons 
order paper and timetable to force through legislation requiring Boris Johnson to ask for an extension at the October 31st meeting. The members of parliament were doing this in March. They did manage to pass legislation doing that. But Theresa May had already come to the decision herself to ask for the extension in April. So so one question is whether they can use legislative mechanisms to try and prevent a deal. Uh, a no deal Brexit. The second option is this idea of a no confidence vote. So Parliament is on recess right now in August. It comes back on September 3rd. Labor leader Jeremy Corbyn is already talking about calling a vote of no confidence in Boris's government. Several years ago, when there was a coalition government, Parliament passed this fixed-term Parliament Act to try and prevent a number of snap elections. So under this new legislation, if you call a vote of no confidence and the government loses that vote, there is a 14-day period where members of Parliament can try and cobble together a government. So could Boris cobble together a different configuration of a government? Could Jeremy Corbyn cobble together uh, a government? And one of the things people have been talking about is a letter-writing government, as they're calling it, essentially a government of national unity. All this government would do is write a letter to Brussels asking them to extend the deadline from October 31st so that there would not be a crash out with no deal. Now, some people are arguing that it's very difficult to see some conservative MPs backing Jeremy Corbyn in doing this. Uh, But that is one of the parliamentary gambits that people are looking at. The other question that people are asking is if Boris Johnson loses a vote of no confidence, In theory, and as I understand it under the legislation, he gets to set the date of the election. So he could say, fine, we'll have an election on November 1st, but we are leaving the EU on October 31st. So then you get into all sorts of debate about whether the queen would get involved and whether the queen could force him to have an earlier election. So people are very uh, deep in the weeds of British constitutional law now looking at these things. But I think the, the, the number of scenarios are either some sort of legislation to request an extension or a vote of no confidence and whether or not you could prevent Boris from setting a later date and whether it would be possible to cobble together a unity government to ask for an extension. Last summer, sleep kept us sane through the silence. This summer, you're going to need sleep to get over all of this. That's why it's the perfect time to upgrade to a Nectar mattress and get award-winning, precision-engineered sleep at incredible value. Prices start at just $499, and you get $399 in accessories thrown in, a 365-night home trial, and a forever warranty. Go to Nectarsleep.com. Hey, podcaster. Meet Acast. We're the top independent podcast network for creators in the know. We empower you to develop your podcast idea, find your audience, and grow listener relationships, wherever those listeners are. You'll also find a whole range of ways to make money, from membership plans for paying fans to our fully curated and creative advertising experience. Visit acast.com slash network to find out more. Acast, for the stories. And do we have a sense of you know, whether that one vote majority, if if a vote of no confidence were put on the floor of parliament tomorrow, not that we've been all that great at anticipating what parliament will do, but do we have a sense of whether the conservative party and the democratic unionists hold together and you actually prevail by one vote on that side? Or would there be, as there were with Theresa May, a whole bunch of defectors from her own caucus? That that absolutely is the, the key question. I Two things. One, that that one vote majority actually relies on 10 votes from the Democratic Unionist Party. So he doesn't even have a majority based on his conservative party. He's already relying on this Unionist Party from Northern Ireland to give him 10 additional votes. Uh, Otherwise, he would be down significantly. And so that's why reverting to a backstop for Northern Ireland only would cost him likely 10 seats. Uh, Second, 
it's really going to be a question for some of these conservative MPs. You've had some of them be very vocal throughout the leadership campaign and even now that they don't support a no-deal Brexit. They think it's going to be disastrous. And so for them, it's really going to be this question of conscience as to whether or not they vote against their leader, what that means for their own seats longer term, and knowing the mood of the public in terms of these these last elections. Now, the Conservative Party has gone up in the polls in the last couple of weeks since Boris has come in. Uh, initially, when he took office, 58 percent of the country had a negative opinion of him. But the question for these MPs is going to be, do they believe so strongly that a no-deal Brexit would be disastrous, that they are prepared to vote down their own party's government and then potentially risk losing their own seats and their government once you have an election? You mentioned their terror of Jeremy Corbyn as a factor. So let's talk briefly about Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, He has been not exactly a profile of principle in the whole Brexit debate. He seems to be more interested in getting to the next election than he is in actually articulating what he thinks should happen with Brexit or preventing Brexit from happening. So where is he situated in all of this? That's all absolutely right. Jeremy Corbyn is a lifelong Euroskeptic. He has voted against every EU treaty that has come before the British Parliament that deepens Britain's involvement in the European Union. He is essentially supportive of Brexit. He just wants to be prime minister so he can negotiate a better deal. So there's been a lot of debate in the last couple of months within the Labour Party about their stance on a second referendum. And he has been very half-hearted in his support for that. People were pointing to a shift about a month ago where he expressed support for a second referendum, but only if it was under Theresa May's deal or a possible no-deal Brexit. If there was a general election and he became prime minister, he no longer supports a second referendum because he wants to negotiate a better deal. And so if there is a general election, he's going to have to take a position on whether or not Labour is the party of Brexit or not. And so what you've been seeing in these recent European elections and local elections is that British voters have a conservative party that can't deliver on Brexit. You have a Labour Party that has a very waffly view on Brexit. And so they're supporting parties that have clear stances, which is the Brexit Party saying, we're going to leave, do or die, we're done. Or the Liberal Democrat Party, which is the only main party that consistently has had a pro-European stance. I just want to point out that the last time we talked, I argued that, you know, this should be the golden age for the Lib Dems. Uh, and and we kind of scratched our heads about why they weren't taking off in the public imagination a little bit. And now they actually seem to be. So other so as as always, you were very politically prescient. Uh, no, and, and no, I, as, uh, for once, I was, <laughs> I was politically prescient. But my, my question is, what's changed for the Lib Dems? This, this should have happened two years ago. Why are people now giving them a look? Is it just the pendency of an impending quality of an election or – They've changed leaders as well. Is, is they, they did change leaders. I, I found the last time we talked about this, I found myself embarrassed not to be able to even name who the Liberal Democrat some leader old was. Guy, I Vince think Vince Cable, I yes, some some uh, older older gentleman uh, who has stepped down, and you now have a a millennial woman who is leading the party. So you've had a generational change within the party. Uh, I think that is creating a new sense of dynamism, and I think there's also just been the political reality of people getting increasingly frustrated, as you were speculating uh, about then, uh, with the two main political parties having very ambiguous positions. There was briefly a flirtation a couple months ago with creating this new party, Change UK, and that was disaffected labor members who were upset with anti-Semitism and Jeremy Corbyn and a couple of conservative members. They did not win any seats in the European Parliament election. And so people have really been coalescing now around the Liberal Democrats as the party that is is making a consistent and strong pro-European stance. Now, they're still not going to win enough seats to be able to form a majority government. They're always going to be more of the the kingmaker, which is, I think, why there is not broader appeal for them than than there is. But they certainly had a very strong showing in the local elections, in the European Parliament elections. And they're the ones that took this labor or the seat from the conservatives last week, which brought Boris's majority from two down to one. 
And of course, they could end up in a situation where labor couldn't form a government without them, which could give them in that kingmaker role a an ability to say, we demand a second referendum as a condition of our participation in a government, right? Right, right. Now, you know, as always with parties that go into coalition, it ends up being negative for the parties. They were in coalition with the conservatives a number of years ago and prompted a number of reforms. That's what led, for example, to this fixed term parliament act was was a result of that coalition. Uh, but certainly I would think if it was that or Boris Johnson who was going to go forward with a no deal Brexit, uh, then that would be possible. Now, again, we've been talking about elections and and future machinations and all of this, but it, of course, still does not answer the question of whether Brexit and under what form of Brexit. So this general election, I think, assuming it happens before the UK crashed out, would essentially then be seen as a, a second referendum on Brexit. But it is difficult if you still have a labor leader that is broadly supportive of it. And then it would become a question of whether or not he would back a second referendum as part of his uh, party manifesto going into an election. Yeah, I mean, it's a second referendum, except in the sense that both sides support leaving to one degree or another, right? It's it's The uh, leaders certainly do. So before we turn to... Uh, other matters. I want to I want to focus briefly on Jeremy Corbyn's substantive views here. He wants you say he wants to negotiate a better deal himself. I don't have the impression, for all my distaste for her, that Theresa May left a whole lot of negotiating leverage on the table, like that she sort of gave away the store to the EU. What is the thing he thinks he can get that she didn't get in those deals that he uh, criticized as not good enough? I mean, interestingly, much of what he wants, I think you could still end up getting under a Theresa May deal. It would just politically require him to support a Theresa May deal. So we tend to talk in shorthand about the Brexit negotiations or the Brexit deal. There's actually two separate documents. The first document is the withdrawal agreement. That's essentially the divorce settlement. It deals with payment, with the Northern Ireland border, with the question of, you know, what the rights of British citizens living in Europe, the rights of EU citizens living in the UK, all of the technical details of what the divorce looks like. And it's it's rather difficult to see how you adjust much of that, leaving aside the conversation we had about the backstop for Northern Ireland. The second document is the political declaration. That's not legally binding, and it deals with the broad framework for what the future relationship between the UK and the EU ends up looking like. And this is also a place that we're starting to see a lot more divergence from Boris Johnson. So I think for Jeremy Corbyn, he would like to see the UK stay in a customs union with the rest of the European Union. And so what he wants could have been addressed in the political declaration by setting that out as a political aspiration for these future negotiations. So that would require a much greater degree of economic and regulatory alignment between the UK and the EU, which of course would make it harder for the UK to negotiate separate free trade deals. Now, for Boris, he wants to have a very limited free trade agreement focused on tariff reduction, but doesn't want to have the same degree of alignment on things like fair competition rules. So a lot of this, and even this question of the backstop for Northern Ireland, still gets at this question of what sort of relationship is the UK going to have with the EU and how closely are they going to be aligned in regulatory terms. And so for Jeremy Corbyn, he would like to have, you know, the control over the borders, the not having to be responsive to the European Court of Justice, some of those things, but still have a fairly high degree of economic alignment through the customs union. For Boris and the hard Brexiteers, they want to have a very loose economic arrangement that essentially reduces tariff barriers but doesn't address any of these fair competition rules. All right. Let's talk about how it all affects us because it is, after all, at the end of the day, all about us. Um, You know, on the one hand, we don't have a dog in this fight. We have good relations with European countries. We have, you know, the special relationship with the EU. And it's not deeply important for U.S. strategic interests whether we're negotiating 
with one entity or two for certain uh, trade purposes and regulatory purposes. On the other hand, lots of people in the United States, including the president, feel like they have a deep interest in this in part because it maps on to some of the populist, nationalist versus anti-populist sentiment that – and sort of establishmentarian sentiment that we're fighting about here. So I I guess my my question is how are we – as a country engaging in this process to the extent that we are engaging with it at all? So a couple of things. First, to the extent we have a dog in the fight, I would say there's Northern Ireland, which is a region that the U.S. historically has invested a significant amount of time and effort into supporting the peace process there. Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell helped negotiate the Good Friday Agreement. And it's not in anybody's interest, including the United States, to have uh, one of the largest European countries descending into an element of sectarian violence. So that that should be uh, an area of of focus for the U.S. And, that- ju- and just to be clear on that, I mean, this is something that our listeners probably pretty engaged with, but that is not a especially remote possibility, right? Right, right. Northern Ireland has not had a government since January of 2017. So it's been over two and a half years since they have had local governance, which they set the Guinness World Record several months ago for beating even Belgium for for not and having Belgium, a government. And Belgium was impressive in that I, They didn't have a government for a very long time. Now, one of the things that has come up with their lack of government is normally what happens, uh, and this happened a number of times in the first decade after the Good Friday Agreement, is if the Assembly and the power sharing agreements in Northern Ireland collapse, the UK resumes what's called direct rule over Northern Ireland, where the power that was devolved to Northern Ireland to the power sharing executive, the legislature reverts back to Westminster and London again passes rules for Northern Ireland. Uh, Interestingly, the UK legislated uh, a couple weeks ago to legalize abortion and gay marriage in Northern Ireland, which was still illegal there, making it distinct from the rest of the UK as well as from Ireland that recently had referenda to, to legalize that. Now, the problem with reimposing direct rule is you've got the Democratic Unionist Party propping up the UK government. And so it privileges one side of the community. Now, some in the British government are saying that no deal is going to be so catastrophic that to have a political entity that doesn't have any government that can't put in place the necessary safeguards to deal with the economic and political consequences is a problem. And so we need to reimpose direct rule. At this point, 20 years after the Good Friday Agreement, it's going to be even more destabilizing to politics there because it's going to prioritize the unionist community and it's going to give the nationalist side no voice in decision making. Uh, We're also seeing continued uh, sectarian elements. There was a car bombing in in Derry, the second largest city in January. There was a journalist that was caught, caught in crossfire and killed a couple months ago by some dissident elements of a Republican group at a funeral. Uh, so things are continuing to be destabilized there politically. Uh, the police chiefs have long been raising the consequences of a no-deal Brexit, the potential for unrest. And there's also reports coming out that are talking about dire economic consequences consequences. So this is not an abstract idea, and this is not scaremongering. We have a community that is post-conflict and that is making good progress, but that peace is not yet solidified. And so all of which distracted you from from the point that you were making before. Yes, I, before yes. I, so our main interest historically in this question has to do with Northern Ireland, Uh, I assume everybody in the United States supports the Northern Irish peace process. Um, So I I guess the naive way to phrase the question is, so what, right? Like, how does our historic involvement with that process affect uh, who lines up on what side of things today? I think what the danger of President Trump's approach to Brexit has been is that he essentially is cheerleading for a no-deal Brexit and championing the prospect of having a U.S.-U.K. free trade agreement after Brexit is done. And his stance ignores the reality and the consequences of what a no-deal Brexit is going to mean for Northern Ireland. So I think you could envision other administrations of, of both 
political complexions, trying to be involved in negotiating some sort of compromise that is not going to lead to this worst case scenario for Northern Ireland. And what I think has been particularly damaging about the Trump administration's approach is that it has not been sufficiently focused on what's happening in Northern Ireland. What's been interesting in the last couple of months is that you've started to see congressional leaders, particularly in the House, raising concerns about this. Uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi took a delegation of members in April to London, Dublin, and Belfast and made very clear, uh, frankly, to some quite surprised conservative supporters of a Brexit, that the U.S. Congress would not necessarily support a free trade deal done by the U.S. and the U.K. if it was done on the back of a no-deal Brexit that was going to harm the peace process in Northern Ireland. She's repeated this in the last couple of weeks following Boris Johnson's comments. And we've also seen a number of other members of Congress, including, interestingly, the co-chairs of the Friends of Ireland Caucus, one of whom is Richard Neal, who chairs the Ways and Means Committee, which is going to have the first crack at a trade deal. And the other one is Peter King, a very senior Republican congressman in the House. And so Congress and has famed been... former supporter of the IRA. I Indeed. So has a a long history of of interest and involvement in in Ireland. And so interestingly, you are seeing the House starting to fill some of this void coming out of the White House in making very clear what the consequences would be on the trade side. Now, in the last week, we saw a letter signed by 45 Republican senators, interestingly not Mitch McConnell, uh, but 45 other Republican senators, saying that, of course, our friendship would continue with the UK no matter how Brexit happened and also suggesting they would be prepared to negotiate a trade deal under any circumstances. So we're now starting to see certainly a a cameral divide on this issue, but also some party divides within the U.S. on this question of a no-deal Brexit and what that's going to mean for trade. And do you you ascribe the lineup there simply to Trump's enthusiasm for Brexit and for the hardline Brexiteers, Johnson and Neil Farage in particular, and Republicans lining up behind Trump? Or is there some more philosophical basis for a kind of partisan split related to Brexit? Because there's nothing, when I think about what the philosophical and ideological issues are, there's nothing obvious that lines up conservatives on behalf of Brexit or or you know democrats on behalf of the you know the EU or a more orderly or Brexit right is is this just the sort of trump aligning with trumpy like people and republicans following trump or is there more to it than that I have a good answer for that question at this stage. I, I want to do more forensics on where this letter came from. Uh, you know, who who was the impetus for the letter? Who started circulating it around the Senate? What was it that motivated all of these members to sign on? Uh, because it's it's such a large number and it's such a one sided partisan statement that it's it's quite curious where that was coming from. I mean, like you said, I both parties have historically supported peace in Northern Ireland. That's not a a partisan issue. And free trade deals are always very complicated in in the U.S. Congress anyway. Uh, So it's it's not clear to me why there would be a desire to make such a strong partisan statement on on this issue. And it's also why I think it's interesting to note that Peter King on the House side, you know, Republican, certainly is not aligning with the Democrats on many other issues, and yet is is one of the ones in the House that is is speaking out about the risks. Well, he is he is historically very solicitous of the interest of Ireland. Finally, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the sudden departure from Washington of of British Ambassador Kim Darrick, who the last time I spoke to was sitting in that chair that you are now in, being a guest on the Lawfare podcast. And I tried and tried and tried to get him to acknowledge uh, the what I called the two elephants in the room, Donald Trump and, and Brexit. And he gamely pretended that all was normal in U.S.-U.K. relations, only then to be himself the punching bag of sort of one or maybe both of the two elephants. First of all, what are your thoughts on on Sir Kim's uh, departure from Washington and, and the circumstances of it? And 
Secondly, how should we understand his, like, is the marginalization of people like him something that is parallel to the process that we've seen in the United States of sort of senior diplomats who, with a lot of experience, being shunted aside, senior intelligence officials being shunted aside and sometimes in a humiliating fashion? Or is it a kind of quirkier, more individual kind of Trump drive-by than that? I think it was an incredibly unfortunate saga, and it really was a shame that that Sir Kim had to leave. He certainly has been a long and experienced diplomat for the UK. He served as their national security advisor. He was due to leave Washington at the end of this year anyway. Uh, as you said, he's always been the quintessential professional. He's appeared on stage with me at at other events, also talking about Brexit, and has been very diligent in his recitation of the uh, government's point of view on Brexit and so has always been very clear in his public engagement and I'm sure in his diplomatic engagements that his job as an ambassador, as is the case with all our foreign service officers, that you are representing the government that is currently elected. And he absolutely did that. I also think most people in Washington would agree that the stuff that he wrote in his cables was not any different from what any of his European counterparts would have been sending back to their capitals as well. And not a word of it untrue, by the way. I, well, and actually quite measured compared yeah. to, to what it could have been. And so it is important to remember these were not public statements he made. These were classified cables that were leaked. And some of them were for very limited distribution within the Capitol as well. And so there clearly was a political incentive by whoever leaked them. Uh, and that whole issue of, of ferreting out the, the leaker seems to have gone uh, quite quiet. I think for Sir Kim's own decision making, there was two factors. One, is there certainly was the reaction in Washington. Trump tweeting that he's not going to deal with him anymore. Uh, lots of questions emerging in Washington about whether he was going to be declared persona non grata, formerly expelled. While that didn't happen, he was certainly getting the deep freeze from senior Trump administration officials. Mnuchin, Wilbur Ross, others were disinviting him from dinners, from meetings. And so I think it was clear to him his effectiveness was going to be limited in Washington. The second factor was that he wasn't getting support from who at that point was was the presumptive prime minister, which was Boris Johnson. Theresa May was very resolute in her defense of him. Jeremy Hunt, who was then foreign secretary, the other contender for the conservative leadership job, was also supportive of him. But Boris Johnson was not. He was actually quite solicitous toward Trump in his very weak uh, comments on Kim Derrick. And so I think Derrick simply saw the writing on the wall, that between not being able to operate in Washington and not having the support of the incoming prime minister, it just made his position completely untenable. Uh, there is a question now of who Boris Johnson is going to send to Washington. That position is currently vacant, you know, being filled by the the, the DCM. Uh, but there is going to be a question for Boris about whether or not he appoints a political ambassador, which there has been some precedent for in the U.S., and perhaps somebody that is more enthusiastic about Brexit, enthusiastic about Trump, or does he send a more reassuring message to the career civil servants in London and appoint a career ambassador, as is generally the standard practice? We're going to have to leave it there. Amanda, thanks so much for, for joining us and for this uh, wide-ranging update on uh, this remarkable collection of, of things that are all happening in the same place at the same time. I think things are only going to get wackier and more complicated uh, as we move into fall. So get your rest in August. Yeah, and, and come back soon. Yes. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution, especially this week. I always try to make a point of saying this when we have Brookings guests. It's a real cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You see it right there. We've got like the Lawfare Podcast with Brookings people on it. It's kind of cool. So thanks this week to Amanda Sloat for coming down the hall, up an elevator, and onto the show. And of course, this is a good reason for you to share the Lawfare Podcast with everyone you've ever met, to give us a review and a rating on iTunes. You know, it's kind of embarrassing that the report has almost as many ratings and reviews in you know three weeks of life as the Lawfare Podcast has over all these years. 
The podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our audio engineer this week is Jacob Schultz. Our music is, as ever, performed by Sophia Yan, who is dodging tear gas canisters in Hong Kong as we speak. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hey, y'all, this is Kenya, creative director and co-founder of Domino Sound. And this is Alexandra De Palma, executive producer and co-founder of Domino Sound. And we're a queer, disabled, Black woman-owned podcast production company and network creating authentic, inclusive, provocative content. We just launched Domino Presents, which is a new series of special audio projects. The premiere episode features the founders of Poppy Juice, the queer art collective throwing the hottest parties in New York City and around the world. We also recommend The Cheat Code, our hit 10-episode audio soap opera surrounding a love affair. Think Love and Hip Hop meets The Affair meets The Sopranos. Follow us on IG at DominoSoundCO to keep up. And listen to our shows on the ACAST app or wherever you get your podcasts. Just search Domino Sound. ACAST, 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 ACAST recommends. recommends.